they already have the job of making a script or an idea safe. Your job is to make it dangerous. It's Jason Bagley's advertising podcast. He interviews important people, it's true. But that doesn't mean that you're not important Cause he didn't choose to interview you Maybe he was just planning to contact you To interview you on another day Or maybe he doesn't have your email address Every creature on the planet is important in their own special way Cows, sharks, and gazelles deserve to be interviewed Birds and whales each have a valid point of view I mean they're probably not as interesting to talk to as you But you're less interesting than the person on this show It's true, I'm not sure what my point is Hello and welcome to the Bagley Talks to an Important Person show where the world's top advertising professionals break down their creative process and reveal the secrets and techniques to doing the best work of your life. I'm your host, Jason Bagley, Olivia Rodrigo fan, former ECD of Widening Kennedy, Portland, and founder of the Audacious School of Astonishing Pursuits, where I teach creatives in eight weeks what it took me 16 years at Widening Kennedy to learn. If you're watching this on YouTube, hi, this is what my face looks like. Let me know what you think in the comments. But if you're listening to the podcast and want to see an anatomical model wearing a Boba Fett helmet or the super detailed presentation decks we share, there's a link to the YouTube channel in the podcast description. I highly recommend it. But without further ado, let's get to today's guest. Today's guest, the very first guest, is responsible for some of your favorite Old Spice Terry Crews work. He also helped create the Samsung Little Wayne campaign. He got Colonel Sanders on an episode of General Hospital. And he helped save the world from the Mayan apocalypse with the Dikembe Mutombo's Four and a Half Weeks to Save the World video game, among many, many, many other amazing pieces of work that he's been involved with. Give it up for Andy Loggenauer, everybody. Andy Loggenauer, welcome to the first ever <laughs> Audacious School of Astonishing Pursuits interview. How do you feel being the first guest on the program? Um, a little honored, a, a little intimidated, um, hopefully helpful. Let's do a little history and talk about how many years ago I didn't want to hire you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I, we could even go. Uh, I mean, I, I went to BYU um, in college to be a civil engineer and I took one math class and failed it badly so i took it again and i got a d minus when i was like that's better than an, it's better than failing but I, so i moved on and realized i was not a going to be a civil engineer your, your engineering um, career was off to a great start <laughs> it's off to a fantastic start and i i was at byu for like seven years i, I mean it's a long time to get a degree in communications with an emphasis in advertising that's but, crazy. Um, I don't think I, I, maybe I forgot this, but I don't remember knowing that because you and I have that in common. We both, I, it took me about seven years to graduate from BYU. I always say that I got a master's degree in undergraduate work. <laughs> um, but There's something about that school, maybe. Why I don't did know. it take you so long? Oh, I don't know. It, I mean, I applied to be an art teacher. Like when I couldn't become a civil engineer, I was like, all right, what's something that doesn't require any math? So I, I applied to be an art teacher. And that was maybe a couple of years down the road. But to apply for that program at BYU, you had to apply and then you had to you had to put in your portfolio and you had to wait for like a year. And in that time, I wasn't taking any classes. So I decided to take an advertising class just cause, you know, to pass the time until I got like word back about if I got into this art teacher program. I liked the advertising class. It actually was like the first class after f four or five years of college that made any sense. And then I didn't get into the art teacher <laughs> class cause or the art teacher program cause my grades weren't good enough. Um, and so I was like, well, I guess I'll do advertising. So I went into advertising and um, at BYU, they have two different tracks. They have like a management track and a creative track. And I was like, oh, I'll try the creative track and I'll be an art director. I applied for the program. They said, you're not an art director. You're a copywriter. 
So they corrected that. And then and it I built like, a book. It sounds like it's just been a nonstop rejection up to this point in the story. <laughs> you, suck really has been. you suck at math. You suck at math. You get turned down for the art teacher. You're like, I'll be an art director. They're like, you suck at art direction. And you're just going to be a copywriter. So everything's just like you got f- sort of forced into <laughs> into being a copywriter. <laughs> I feel like I was just like putty in the hands of the system. Like I'll be whatever you want me to be, wherever you're like, set me. All right. You want to accept me as a civil engineer? That's fine. I'll try art teacher. Oh, not that either. Okay. How about art director? No, not that. Okay. Copywriter. I'll do that. I'll be whatever you want me to be. Just get me out of school. (laughs) I've been here for seven years. (laughs) That's almost exactly what it was. Uh, And then you, you actually came to BYU my, my, like my final year. And I remember asking you, like I had just did an internship in New York, and I remember asking you, like, oh, what's it like to not to work in an ad agency? You were at Wyden and Kennedy at the time. I was like, oh, what's it like to work in an ad agency, not in New York? Because I didn't really love my time in New York. Um, and you're like, oh, you should send me your book. And so I was like, oh, cool. And I sent you my book, and I think like the next day, you're like, uh, this isn't Wyden and Kennedy material. Make these changes. Get back to me in like a week. And I was like, oh, he's never going to, I'm never going to get this stuff done. Let let, let me straighten out this story. Please tell me that I didn't say this isn't widening Kennedy material. That's, that was how you took, you took it. I hope I said, I I hope I said something less, uh, horrible sounding. I, I think you did say like, I like this. I think I have like five or six pieces in there. And this was, back with like hard copy, like I didn't have a website. It was like a real like portfolio book. And so there was no, like the only TV in there was like thumbnails from the, the, the videos that we made, like there was no like interaction to it. So I had sent it in and I think you were like, I kind of like this, I kind of like this, but most of this needs a lot of work. Um, if you're hoping to get into wide ending Kennedy, um, Send it back to me on Friday uh, with some changes, and I'll. Uh, Boy, I really gave you a pass- long. Uh, I really gave you a lot of time. <laughs> you really did. Uh, and that was Thursday afternoon, and you're like, "Give it back, to, give it to me tomorrow." No, but I was like, it was a pipe dream. I was like, "Oh, he's, I'm not going to get into Whited and Kennedy," so I didn't do it. I didn't. I don't think I sent you. I didn't make any changes. I didn't send you the book, um, and. And then eventually, I don't know how. Sounds like just you had just unstoppable uh, ambition. (laughs) Ambition. (laughs) Yeah, I was an unstoppable force. Um, But yeah, then I mean, somehow you maybe know more of the story than I do on the Wyden and Kennedy end. But somehow Lauren Ranke got my book. Somehow Mark Fitzloff got my book after I had sent it to you. And they liked it more than you did, I guess. <laughs> and so they gave me an internship at Wyden and Kennedy. And eventually I, I wound up writing some Facebook posts for you for Old Spice. You liked them. I could hear Eric Baldwin laughing from across the building. So I knew that the, post, the Facebook posts I'd written were good. And then you gave me more opportunities and I eventually got hired to work with you on Old Spice. So, the, so what happened... And Fitzloff gave you an internship and put you on my account on Old Spice. And then I was like, oh, no, this is this. <laughs> now this is going to be awkward because it's my alma mater and I'm going to feel pressure to give give this guy a job. And I don't know if I don't know if he's good enough. And what I would say. You immediately started to crush it as like an intern. You I don't remember the Facebook post at what point that was, but I do remember that you, you eventually got on a pretty big TV brief for old spice and you beat out all the, the full-time senior teams. Like you had the best idea. It turned out to be an idea that was $14 million to produce. So it didn't go anywhere, but, um, so I learned a quick lesson about putting water in scripts. Yeah. Water is expensive. expensive. What I would say is that your portfolio didn't really reflect, except for a, a few pieces, 
it didn't really reflect you. It was kind of more generic, like didn't feel like you had totally found your voice yet. And there was a couple things which I remember being impressed with that were kind of non ad things. I think you did like a rap for your sister's birthday or something. And you had some yeah. personal projects. And I was like that, like, I wish the whole book had that personality and that voice coming through, which I would say now your work does have. So, um, it's just a further lesson to students to like, try to find your thing and make that come through really strong in your portfolio and not just be do like generic ads of what you're supposed to do or what you think other people will like, just try to do stuff that you like that, that, that you're excited about and don't worry as much about what other people think, because I think you were an example of sort of a hidden gem that didn't necessarily show up fully in your portfolio other than those couple of pieces. So luckily Fitzloff was wiser than me and <clears throat> brought you on. And then we hired you. It all worked out for me. It all worked out. And your seven years of undergraduate work paid off. So today I wanted to get into just a little bit about Andy Loggenauer's process and how you go about, you know, you've been uh, a very successful creative. You're very prolific, which is something I teach my students constantly is talking about. You got to be prolific. All the, there's no great creatives that are not, that don't generate a lot of ideas and you, you definitely fall into that category. And you have, I, th I think very much like found your creative voice, which is another thing that I talk a lot about. Like you, you have to find your thing and not that that thing has to be narrow, but you've got to get comfortable with like, what's your personality and how does that come out creatively and really embrace that? Because that's the only thing that's going to make you unique compared to anybody else. But why don't you, uh, let's, let's see if we can get technology to work and you share your screen and take us through a little bit of your process or a lot of bit of your process. A lot of bit. All right. So, so I put this little deck together. It's under a hundred slides. So that's good. Um, about how to write an Andy Loganauer script. And I think, and I think it's important to point out, like, this is how I do it. Everyone else has their own process. Like, and I think there'll be stuff in here that I say that, some of you might be like, oh, this does, this won't work for me or something like that. But this is just how I do it. And maybe there'll be some things in here that you'll adopt or take on and try out and see if they work. And I mean, this is 10 years in the industry. Like I definitely wasn't doing it like this when I started. Um, but this is how I do it now. Um, a couple of things to get out of the way. I'm definitely not a writer. Like I'm not a novelist. I'm not like a poet or anything like that. I'm definitely not like an English major person. Like I'm not great at grammar. And Jason can talk to that a bit because like I remember some of my scripts, especially early on, were just a mess. And I would like cut and paste things. Like I would work really fast and there would just be sentences that would just end or just think words next to each other that didn't make any sense. I've since like learned that I need to polish my work a little bit more than it was, but I'm definitely not like a great, like writer, writer. Um, and I don't think you need to be, uh, to have like a good script. Um, yeah, I can confirm that. And Andy had absolutely hor horrible grammar, <laughs> spelling, everything, which one, first of all, was kind of funny. And second of all, I didn't really care because you were very prolific from from the start. And I'd much rather have a writer that generates a lot of ideas and a lot of crazy ideas. Uh, and we can always fix the grammar and the spelling. Yeah. And that that's like a theme throughout this deck is like, um, don't be too precious. I mean, I think that there is a level of professionalism that you need to have. But like, I mean, no one's ever going to see the deck or the scripts like when it comes to like watching a spot. So just as long as it makes sense and is clear and um, you don't have to write like Les Miserables to like to get a, a spot sold. Uh, so here we go. And I think it's 
um, kind of like nine steps and with the step zero. And I think this is important. I think this is something um, that all aver- all advertisers, like especially creative um, people should do is just watch a ton of stuff. Like we work in a visual medium. And so that there's, it's like said, like one of the best ways to become a novelist is to read lots of novels. Like I feel like one of the best ways to make film or to make like picture um, is to watch it and to learn from it. And so like, I watch a ton of stuff um, whenever I have downtime. I mean, I'm not just like some couch potato, but I do watch like a lot of TV. I watch a lot of YouTube clips and just everything. So, um, something that, sorry to interrupt Andy, but the no, you're good. something that came up last night in, in one of the uh, Q and a sessions was a writer who is very much a writer um, asked, how does she come up with more visual ideas? Like her, her default is always words. Like there's a problem, there's a brief, I can solve it. The way to solve it is with words. And that's how she thinks. And she was like, how do I get, she's on a brief right now where they one, it's only 15 seconds, but also I think they've, the brief is asking that it be more visual, less words. And also sometimes even without the brief, you just want to like, you don't want to have only one way to solve a problem with it. Words did it. And one of the things I told her is like, just watch a lot of visual stuff and start to kind of copy some of that. And, but how have you, do you have anything else besides just like watching a lot of stuff? Like when you watch the stuff, are you paying attention specifically in sort of bookmarking things that are really cool visually that you might want to use someday or how does that work? Yeah. Sometimes when it comes to like camera moves and, th- and kind of like tricky things that a director might do to like tell a little mini story within a story, I'll kind of pay attention to that or like take note of it. Like, Oh, that was kind of cool. Like, why did I like that? Um, I also have wa- I like one of the things that I think is worth watching, especially if you're trying to figure out um, how to write kind of visual storytelling is there's lots of like YouTube channels about filmmaking and people talking about filmmaking and people talking about why certain movies or certain scenes are so iconic and stuff like that. And some of them get pretty granular. Like there's this one YouTube channel that I've watched. It has since been canceled, but it's really good. It's called every frame of painting. And there's actually two episodes in there in particular that I think every advertiser, especially comedy writer, should watch. And one of them is about Edgar Wright and how Edgar Wright does visual comedy. And it's just so good. And it just really talks about like all of kind of the camera tricks that he uses and, and different ways of, of like creating comedy visually, um, which is really good. And then there's another one all about Buster Keaton and silent film comedy, which I think is worth watching as well, especially if like you're not, it, it kind of shows you how to be comedic and I'm going to talk a lot about comedy because I, I think at my core, I'm a comedy writer, but I think this applies to like um, more serious and earnest advertising as well Is like um, how to like move somebody without words. I think it without dialogue is something that you kind of need to work into your script at some point. Like I think everybody will eventually write a spot or be asked to write a spot that's like visually captivating and so, um, yeah, the these, those two clips in particular. What's the name of that YouTube channel well, again? Um, Every Frame of Painting. And then there's also one called, like, Notes from the Screenplay, I think, which is pretty good. And it talks about, like, movies and, and why certain directors and writers wrote things a certain way. But I liked Every Frame of Painting a little bit better. Right. Um, and they have just, like, a ton of stuff. They have one all about Jackie Chan that's really good and um, – Yeah. And I think that's something to note in advertising, which I think is something exciting about being a creative in advertising is you only have like 30 seconds or 60 seconds or 90 seconds. Like you have this little like nugget of a clip compared to like a whole movie or compared to a whole TV show. And you actually have like a lot more leeway, I feel, to be really creative with like how you film it in an ad than you do in like a regular TV show. Like a lot of sitcoms, it's just like, a two camera set up on a stage on a sound stage. They don't really get that tricky or anything like that. 
Yeah. Um, same with the, same with the whole movie, but in a film or in like a commercial, you can cr- like you just try and cram in as much fun and interesting material as, as possible. Try and get that camera to move around, do some fun stuff behind the scenes to help get that story told. And and you learn all that stuff by watching it. Um, I don't think I've ever invented my own camera move, or I don't think I've ever invented like my own technical film thing it's all been taken for like referenced from other things that already exist so yeah and i think maybe just to just to read this list off this might answer some of that is like as you're watching try and be mindful of like the things that you're watching like um be inspired by the things that you watch um copy the things that you love make fun of the things you don't love um like there's lots of times where i'm watching a show and i'll be like oh they should I think it would have been better if they would have done it like this. And then I kind of file that away and um, save it for some other thing. And you just watch stuff. Um, good stuff is great, but also you can learn a lot from bad stuff. Um, and not even, I again, I'm mostly a comedy writer at heart, I think, but I probably get most of my ideas from dramas. Like I, I don't think I have to watch comedy to learn comedy. Like very often, I'm inspired by serious things that I've seen that I then turn into something funny um, or comedic, I guess. Yes, which we'll um, get to later. Yeah. Um, so step one, that was step zero. That's like, that's just all prep. I think just be a student of, of um, and again, YouTube clips, funny things. They don't have to be like Citizen Kane, like, just to always be trying to look for new film and new things to be inspired um, to do. So step one, you get the brief, <laughs> never look directly into the brief. Like it's almost like the sun. Like it's never look directly into the sun. It's, it's personally uh, briefs are like Medusa. You'll, you'll turn yeah. the stone if you look directly at it. <laughs> yeah. And some people are really good at like, taking a brief and dissecting it, getting really strategic and like coming up with a really good idea. That's like, just like a perfect strategy type spot or idea. I'm not like that. I'm, I don't think I'm like that analytical. So a lot of times I'll just get the brief, read it, try and get like the general goal that they have for like the project and then put it away and just try and keep that in my mind. Or I'll just take like, sometimes this, at least at, On Old Spice, the strategist would write almost kind of like a tagline, like a strategy line. And I would just kind of keep that at the top of my Word doc just to kind of remind myself like, oh, this is kind of what it's supposed to be about, but don't worry about it too much. Um, Like you you don't want like the brief to get in the way of a good idea, if that makes sense. And yeah, and I think that's kind of um, what this slide is all about is like just to once you start working, just try and make stuff that you would love, um, stuff that you would like to watch. And then if it's close enough to the brief and you love it, you'll find a way to work the brief into it better down the line. Like the, again, this, these scripts and this, these ideas that you write down, they'll just get poked and prod through the whole process. And so over time, this, this idea will become more and more honed. Um, but right now just try and focus on writing something that you would love to see. Um, and then the brief will come later. But, and then I felt like adding this slide in there. I was very fortunate to work on old spice for a long time and they gave, they were pretty lenient and their briefs were really great. And they were really good at like, kind of like letting us do a back door into the brief and stuff like that. But I have also had like difficult briefs and difficult clients at, at White and Kennedy and since I've been freelancing and some things that I've learned, these, this is maybe just kind of a digression, but something, some things that I've learned about harder briefs is sometimes like just lean into it. Um, oftentimes if you take a step back and look at what the client is asking for, you'll see how ridiculous it is, or you'll see the like inherent comedy of just how stupid advertising is. I think it's worth leaning into that. And instead of like trying to pull a fast one on the audience, on like the people at large, laugh with them at how dumb this is or how like how ridiculous these things are that like the client or the brief is asking you to do. And so like two ways that I or three ways that I found of kind of leaning in to a difficult brief 
especially if like it's really prescriptive, like if they really like are specific on what they want you to say, the first one is see if you can put it to music. That is just the easiest way of like taking something very sterile and very, very like boring and making it entertaining. And I'm not a, I'm not like a music writer. And so I'll take songs that I've liked that are very easily adaptable and see if I can like change the lyrics to fit with the brief that I have, like see my vest from the Simpsons. I've probably written that song with different lyrics a hundred times somewhere out there from American tale. Same. Like, it's just like taking these melodies that already exist and putting the words from the brief in there. Another one is a ridiculous spokesperson. If you're being asked to say some pretty dumb stuff or some pretty like prescriptive Addy stuff. See if you could get somebody really interesting to say it for you. Again, I've write, I've written so many scripts where Werner Herzog is basically reading the brief, but just because it's Werner Herzog and just the way that he talks and the earnestness that he has, it makes it funny. So yeah, a ridiculous Werner spokesperson Herzog talking about laundry detergent is funny. That's funny. And then kind of the last one. I think this is kind of an overarching. Um, note for most of my work, I think this is something I learned from Craig um, Allen when he was my CD with you, Jason, was just get the commercial out of the way. Like if they have something very particular they want you to say or like some kind of wording that feels very addy, say it up front and then have fun with the rest of the commercial. Like if you can do the boring part that the client wants you to do in the first five to 10 seconds do it and then somehow build that into something more fun and more interesting on the back end. Use that last 20 seconds to have fun. And sometimes that works because a lot of times I feel like the client just loves having their name in the first five seconds of the, of the spot. They always do. And then step two. So I've gotten the brief. I've kind of probably thought of some ideas, but then I like to step aside, take a little alone time, stop looking at the brief, stop, like don't sit in front of my camera. Um, I like to let my brain do all the work at this point. Um, And normally it's setting aside my computer, getting up, leaving, especially when we were at the, in the office at Wyden and Kennedy, I would leave my desk, go for a walk, go for a run or sit at my desk and watch YouTube videos, try and like just kind of keep the brief in the back of my mind. But let my brain subconsciously do most of the work and it would ultimately stuff would come like you would just get ideas. And as they start coming up, focus on them and let them build in your brain. And um, if you like them, write them down when you get back to your computer. If you take like an hour long break, when you get back, write down everything you thought of that's still alive or that you still like after that hour, even if it's like a half baked idea, write it down. Uh, maybe your partner, when you meet up with your partner, they'll be able to add on to what you had. Yeah. So taking a moment, stepping aside, letting your brain do most of the work and then coming back and writing down what you thought of. And like, I, I think in my career, I found where I get my ideas. Um, I get them running. I get loads of ideas in the shower or driving, watching YouTube, watching TV, taking a walk, taking a nap. And I do not get my ideas trying to think of an idea at my computer or sitting down in a room with my partner or reading books, um, which is a waste of time, which is kind of a joke. But like for some reason, when I read books, my I'm too focused on it. But yeah, I get most of my ideas, especially my initial ideas away from my computer, away from my partner um, doing other things. But not always like what happens if my brain isn't coming up with an idea and I need to meet with my partner the next day or something like that to start sharing ideas. So this happens to everybody. I think no matter how prolific somebody is or how much good work they make, um, this is bound to happen to everybody. You just feel like you start scraping the bottom of the barrel. Um, so this is what I do when that happens. Um, I start kind of running my, my brain through certain things. The first one is parody. Have I seen anything lately that I feel like I can recreate or make funny or that pertains to um, what I'm thinking of with the brief? Watch something. 
again, watching clips of things. Like if I feel like my brain isn't going, maybe I'll go back and watch some things that I've already seen that I've already been inspired by. Like, again, mentioning those um, every frame of painting, but also like other ads that I really admire. Like I'll go back and I'll watch them just to get like that brain kind of rolling and kind of get it like lubricated and moving, I think helps. And then if none of those work, I go to the bank and I'm going to have like a few kind of like vocabulary terminology in here that are not, I would not say are industry wide. I have what I like to call the bank, which is kind of a list in my head of things that I know I like things that I know to me are funny. And, and then I try and see if those things can work into the brief. And so here are some of mine, like, and they're just like simple, dumb kind of jokes, like the, like people being swallowed by things and living in the stomachs of animals, kind of like Pinocchio style to, to me, for some reason, that's really funny of having people living in stomachs, um, ridiculous items of wealth. Is there a way to like work a Lamborghini in there or a yacht or like a luxurious mansion? Like there's something about opulent wealth that I get a kick out of. Um, I think has like some inherent comedy to it. Space and space scientists. Like I just love, it's just so, I guess like to me, I think we're getting a little look into my brain to me for some reason, space is so vast and huge and it's just intimidating that there's a bit of humor to it for me for some reason. Um, I have this whole section about inanimate objects. I love the idea of people being beat up by inanimate objects inanimate objects, living out human lives having families, jobs, driving cars, except stuff like that. And then what I think is equally funny is inanimate objects living out these lives and people treating them like people. For some reason, I get a kick out. Like if you imagine like a house plant that drove a car around, had a job and everyone just treated them like a normal person. I think that's funny. There's something really dumb and funny about face caressing to me. Like people <laughs> like romantically touching each other's faces. I think that's so silly. Foreign languages, not that they're funny, but I find them very interesting. And so there's a lot of times where I'll kind of have people say things in Japanese or even just like a little quip, like, oh, is there a way I can kind of sneak in like some Gaelic here or something? Just, I don't know, add a little bit of texture to a spot. People breaking things, general destruction. Is there a way I can blow up a car? Is there a way I can knock over a building? You can be a little, especially if you're having trouble thinking of ideas, be a little selfish. Like what's something you want to do on set? I would love to blow a car up on set. I would love to knock a building over on set. People talking at the same time. I love people talking over each other. I think there's some real comedy to that, especially in, in an ad that is supposed to be polished and, and scripted. There's something funny about them not being able to get a sentence out. And then skeletons. I think skeletons are hilarious. So There's nothing funnier than skeletons. Right Nothing's funnier than a skeleton. We'll get back to Andy and Jason in a moment, but if you want to listen to the full version of this episode and all other episodes of Bagley Talks to an Important Person, check out Creative Mega Machine, Jason's exclusive eight-week creative coaching and mentorship program where Jason throws six metric tons of highly illegal, non-EPA-approved rocket fuel on your career. Through on-demand lessons and live Q&As with Jason, he will personally answer all your questions as he reveals all the secrets and techniques that he and his teams used when they created iconic campaigns for Nike, Old Spice, KFC, Meow Wolf, and several others. You will learn in eight weeks what took him 16 years at Wyden and Kennedy. There is absolutely nothing out there that will accelerate your career faster than this five-star rated program. Classes are capped at 18 students to grab your spot before they're gone. Go to schoolofastonishingpursuits.com to learn more about Creative Mega Machine. Let's get back to the podcast. When you say the bank, I probably have my list of things, which are, you know, probably there's some overlap with your list of things because I think rich people are hilarious. Um, <laughs> but I also just have like Instagram folders and TikTok folders and YouTube folders of just funny things that I want to do something with at some point. And or cool things. It might be like, like you said earlier, there's like a, a camera move or a camera technique or some something that a director did that I'm like, that's so cool. It doesn't, I don't know how I will ever use it, but when I get a new brief, I want to be able to go back to that clip and be like, all right, is there any way I can use this technique on this brief? And the same thing goes for like all the more specific things of like, how do I get a skeleton in this? How do I 
you know, have ridiculous rich people in this or whatever. But I think it's important yeah. to have those go to things that you love. If I'm hearing you right, Andy, the bank is a bank of things that you personally love. It's not it's not there for anybody else. It's like these are the things that I I know I like, so I'm gonna constantly go back to them on on every brief that I come up with. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's different for everybody. I remember there was this one time at Whiting and Kennedy where I sat next to two very talented copywriters, um, Heather Ryder and Darcy Burl. And we actually talked about this and, and I don't want to give away any of their secrets, but Heather, the thing that she thinks is very funny is when people get their hands chopped off for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and and Darcy loves people shedding their skin like a husk, like a snake. Like those are two things that they both <laughs> found very funny when they would often work into scripts. And two things that I wouldn't put in my bank. I don't know if I find getting your hands off that funny. But it's it's different for everybody. And yeah, it's very personal. It's not – this will come up a little later. It's not stuff that I think my CDs would like. You kind of have to be a little selfish at this point. Like really think about what is something I want to make? What is something I think would be fun? Um, and then you have your dreams get ripped away as through the process. <laughs> but yeah, you, 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 at this point, you're a little selfish and you are trying to make things that excite you. Um, and then you share those things with your partner and you let your partner rip them to shreds. Um, but really, like you share all the ideas that you when you took that time away and you thought about it, you wrote it down. I like to then after uh, anywhere from a few hours to the next day, talk to my partner about them and be open to listening to the feedback that they have and, and working together on ideas that you like. A lot of times just sharing your idea with them is a good filter in and of itself. Like if you're be embarrassed while you're sharing it to them, it might not be a great idea. Like when you're like saying it out loud, sometimes you can see like, oh, this idea isn't as good as I thought it was in my head. But if like you're saying it, you're still excited about it. That's a good sign <clears throat> that you're sharing it with somebody and that they are, you're excited to share it and they might be excited to listen to it. Um, but yeah, listen to your partner. They'll, they'll give you good feedback. They'll give you bad feedback um, take it or leave it, but also give them, like, they've probably been working on this too. Give them feedback, have like a mutual respect. So yeah, tell your partner what your brain came up with, share your ideas, have like a good brain dump session with them and be the scribe like copywriters and art directors. I think it's worth while you're talking with your partner to write down the things that you're liking. Um, I can't stress that enough to write it down. You always think like, oh, I'll remember. But then in, you could leave the meeting and be like, oh, wait a second. What were we just talking about? So always write it down. Never trust yourself to, to keep it in your brain box. And even if it's not quite there, like sometimes in those, in those first meetings with your partner, you'll be talking about an idea and it's not a, oh, the majority of the time, it's not a fully fleshed out script yet. Um, it's, I, for me, it's very rare that I walk out of this meeting with my partner and I have like 10 scripts all written out. That doesn't happen. It's an occasional script that's mostly written out, but most of the time it's just a paragraph of ideas. And sometimes it's just one line or one gag that you're both laughing at and you maybe don't know why, and you're both enjoying it. Try and write those things down verbatim as fast as you can before you forget it. Because sometimes the, that joke or that line or that thing that you guys are working on is pretty nuanced. And if you go back and you kind of summed it up, you might not ever find that magic again. So try and write it down verbatim if you can. But it definitely does not need to look like a script yet. Step four, <laughs> I uh, more alone time. So I'll have this meeting with my partner. I'm actually kind of an introvert, kind of a private person. So I think I step four for me is like recharging the batteries a little bit. I've just spent a couple hours with my partner. I'm a little worn out, but I'll take another break. Um, and it seems like I'm not working, but I am. I think 
it's important to just constantly be take time to evaluate the things that you're working on and to take time to think about um, what you just talked about. Give it a little bit of time to marinate. Um, I find that stepping away um, and taking time is a good filter of bad ideas. Like if, if, if you think it's good or funny, you write it down, you leave and you come back and it's not that good or fun or funnier anymore. It's not, then maybe scrap it. Like you might've just been caught up in the moment or something. Yeah. And then now we start writing. We write the first draft after we take a little break. So a fi- something for me about the first draft is it's a first draft. A first draft does not care about how long it is. It doesn't care about the client. It doesn't care about the budget. It doesn't care what anybody thinks except yourself. And so to be honest, a first draft is kind of like a mix of an arrogant jerk and a cool renegade. <laughs> um, people will make you refine your scripts as the, throughout the process. Don't worry about that stuff in the first draft. Be conscious of it. Like, Don't write like five pages of a script and expect it to be a 30-second spot. I just don't get out the stopwatch and time it. Um, a lot of times I'll just write it as be- like what I imagine is like its best form. And then through time, it'll shrink. Um, we'll have to cut it down to time or the client will have notes or the budget will come in and we can't use a certain thing. That'll happen later. Right now, just try and write a spot that you enjoy that doesn't worry about that stuff. Um, I think that's something that you've always been good at. Uh, I think it's a smart way to approach it is that usually the first round of work that we would see from you was like too long and too many sentences. And, (laughs) uh, and that was fine because the the idea was there. There was a, there was always a concept there. There was always an idea there, and there was usually some funny writing, and the grammar was off, the spelling was off, the time was off. It was too long. There was it didn't matter. Like at that phase of the process, it doesn't need to be perfect. Yeah, and I learned pretty quickly with you and Craig that like even if I went in there with a perfectly polished script, even if you guys liked it it was going to get butchered in that, in that check-in. And I think that's just a case of like knowing who you're working with. Like you and Craig, when I worked with you guys were so hands-on and so like funny and clever and smart that when I just knew, like, I don't need to spend an hour on a script because it's probably going to get destroyed in the check-in, even if they like it. It's probably going to get completely butchered. So not just des- get not destroyed, just plussed, Andy. <laughs> just plussed. It, it will be exploded and then put back together in better pieces, um, like the bionic. Man. But yeah, and so it's all about kind of like um, the economics of time and effort. Like I did, I over time I realized, oh, I don't need to go in there with like a perfectly polished thirty second script because it's probably going to get most likely changed even if they love it it's not going to be the same the other thing so get the the other thing in addition to that is you were good at which i think all the best creatives are at not worrying about what was possible and you were you were pretty good at at pushing things to the to the edge of madness which i think which i tell my students they got to do because it's it's the CD's job and the account director's job and the client's job. They they're all they already have the job of making a script or an idea safe. Your job is to make it dangerous. Don't yeah don't repeat get, everyone else's job. <laughs> yeah, you get to be the kid and let everybody else be the adult. There was actually like a stretch of time where I where I was working with Max Stinson, who's like. Uh, I mean, an incredible art director. And we actually just thought it'd be fun to see if we could stump directors. Like, could we write a spot that directors would not know how to shoot or they would not know how to do it? And that's kind of like, that was kind of a challenge that we gave ourselves was, can we make this so ridiculous that a director would be like, I don't know how to do this. Mm-hmm. So, and you can do that as a creative that, and you maybe wouldn't be able to do that as a, as a creative director. Um, 
just trying to be as irresponsible as possible. So now we're actually going to get into how I write my scripts. And it's a lot like there'll be a handful, like more than a handful of slides here. I, Jason has asked me to be very thorough. <laughs> You've asked me to be very thorough. So I was very thorough. And again, this is just how I do it. It's very like p- some people write like in the form. Of, I don't even know what the form is called, but like how screenwriters write movies. Like some people like format their pages like that and stuff. I'm not, I don't do that. I'm not like that um, skilled or studied, I guess, um, in the art of script writing. But this is just how I do it. And really, and you might see my whole thing is just all about getting it down as fast as you possibly can um, and not belaboring it too much. And so the, so we, you have a few concepts from your partner and you that you're liking. Um, and a lot of times I sit down in front of my computer and I'm stuck with, should I write the stage direction first or should I write the dialogue first? Or is it both? Because sometimes like maybe my partner and I have really hashed out the stage direction and, and, but we haven't maybe figured out exactly what's being said. If anything's being said at sometimes it's the other way around where we've really thought out the dialogue, but not, not necessarily the stage direction. And sometimes we've hashed out a whole spot and we know exactly what's going on visually and exactly what's going on in the dialogue. A lot of times I'll sit down and just see what I have in my notes. Do I have most of the stage direction down or at least what I want? Okay, I do. I'll write the stage direction first and do the, and do like the specifics of the dialogue after. Sometimes it's the other way around where I know exactly what the people are going to be saying, but I don't know exactly what they're going to be doing. I just write it down, write down the dialogue and then figure out the stage direction and the scenario after. Oh, it's Andy, just all about going back. I, yeah. I'm I'm going to backtrack a little bit because I just had a thought. You're in the concepting phase before we get to the script writing phase. You focus a lot mm-hmm. on taking breaks laziness, just being kind of a lazy person in general, that that's the key to having good ideas. Um, I, but I think, tell me if I'm wrong, cause we haven't, I was your creative director. So I wasn't with you during the entire creative process, your creative process, but mm-hmm. just seeing your output, which was always impressive and was always a lot of ideas. I'm assuming and I'm hoping you're going to give the correct answer on this that aligns with what I, what I try to teach people is that it was kind of like a intense work, take a break, intense work, take a break. Like when you were sitting down writing ideas, you were writing a lot of ideas because you would have had to, because I know when you brought them to me, you always had a ton of ideas. So would you say that's accurate? I would say yes. And especially when it came to writing scripts, this is, again, just me. I have a hard time starting. So there's a lot of times where I would sit down to write a script or to start writing my scripts and I wouldn't feel motivated or I would feel like, um, I don't know, like my brain was wandering or something and I'd start watching YouTube clips or something. And then I would just tell myself, I just have to start because if I just start, it'll just start rolling. And I think that was the case with me where I would, once I started writing, I would just write as long as I could and as much as I could until I had worn myself out. Um, So that like I would write for hours um, because I knew it was hard for me to get it start. Like there's momentum to it for me. Yeah. And And if I stop a step away. That that's Great. That was the correct answer. You, 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 I don't have to edit this out and change your answer. No, it, that's very much in line. I think that's, that's really good because I also think what you just described is what almost every creative deals with is like, they're either not in the mood or they feel like they don't have a great idea to start writing down. And what I've been trying to, to a process that I just took uh, the first two classes through is 
don't put so much judgment upon yourself. Don't even don't even think about whether you have a good idea or not. Just start having bad ideas. Just start having ideas that you don't judge at all. And if you write if you write the worst script that's ever been written, that's success because you wrote something down and then write the next script and write 10 scripts that are the worst scripts that have ever been written. It doesn't matter. Just keep writing and just keep writing just gibberish. Like sometimes I would literally, I would just try to get myself into momentum. If I didn't have a thought or an idea, I would just start writing things that don't even make sense that just come into my head almost like stream of consciousness, or I would start writing. I would go from stream of consciousness into writing a note to my best friend in Arizona or a joke to him, or I would literally write, I'm a terrible copywriter. I don't have any ideas. I'm sitting here because I'm about to get fired because I have no ideas, like just stream of consciousness. And then often that stream of consciousness of writing, I might write two paragraphs two long paragraphs of just absolute chip, not nothing resembling an advertising script at all. And then something comes out that gives you, you one of those gibberish sentences comes out and it gives you an idea or it makes you laugh. And that starts an actual concept pops out or, or not. It doesn't really matter at that point. It doesn't matter <clears throat> if it's good or not just like writing just doing or, or writing or drawing or whatever the case may be, whatever phase of the process you're in, just don't judge yourself. Just get stuff pumping it out, which it sounds like I, I knew you must have done because you always came with so many ideas. Yeah. And I think, I think that I didn't, I didn't like write letters to my best friend in Arizona. For one thing, I don't have any friends in Arizona, but that's too bad. For me, it was they're, doing, they're really cool. Yes. Andy. <laughs> There's great people there. Um, for me, it was going back to my notes. This is often how my writing would like how that kind of that flow of, of writing would start is I'd go back to my notes with my partner and look at which of these spots is pretty much already written. And all I need to do is just take it from this page, reformat it a little and put it onto this new page. And that's how I would start where it's like, oh, this thing is pretty much already written. I'll just put it in here reformat it, add some things here and there, and then it would flow from there. It's really just like a path of least resistance to me. Like what's the first step for me was always like, what's the easiest thing? Okay, let's do the easiest thing. And then once I started going, I could do the rest of it. It was yeah. just kind of getting it started. And once it was started, I would just write until I was done. Okay. I've taken us off track. We've finished the stage direction or dialogue. Doesn't matter. Just get it down. All right. Next slide. Yeah. And, and just really quick on this slide, I think that's why this slide is here is again, like the path of least resistance to that script. Sometimes the path of least resistance is to just write down the stage direction. And sometimes it's just to write down the dialogue and then go back in and add the other stuff. Um, it's just all about writing. So now we're going to get into like some real nuts and bolts <laughs> for me. When I write a script, this is like, the most nuts and bolts of anything. The dialogue is bolded and the stage direction is not. Um, so like, here's a little snippet from a script that I wrote. As you'll see, there's not a lot of formatting to it. It's just the stage direction. The car crashes through a stained glass window and into a massive pool. If it's not bolded, that's the stage direction. And then the man says, so ramming a $300,000 car into a pool, not impressing you. That's the dialogue. And then back to the stage direction. The woman shakes her head no. The car is sinking faster now, and the car's cabin is almost full of water. And the man says, well, I might be starting to regret my frivolity. So that's basically all my scripts. I don't do any indentations. I don't do any, like, fancy, like, um, setups or anything like that. It's just um, dialogue, or dialogue is bolded. Stage direction is not bolded. Um, and if you'll notice, if we go back to the slide, like I'm going to talk about a little bit about like how much stage direction and how much dialogue, because really you want your script to flow. You need to remember that 
your CDs aren't going to be reading your scripts. Like you're going to be reading them to your CDs. And so you almost kind of have to like present it to them the best way possible. It almost should like, you should almost be painting a picture in their head. And so like too much stage direction between lines of dialogue can really slow your spot down and it can like take all the energy out of it when you're reading it to your CDs and between sections though, they might even forget what the, what the people are even saying because you're just explaining the stage direction and it's just too long if it's too big of a chunk. And the same goes with dialogue. If the dialogue is in this huge clump, a lot of times what I find myself thinking is if I'm reading or I'm listening to a long block of dialogue, I'm thinking like, well, what am I seeing as this person is saying all this stuff? And so it's kind of this fine dance of how much stage direction to put between each line of dialogue and how much dialogue to put in between each line of stage direction. Cause you really want this, this, you want to like paint the picture of the spot in the head of your creative directors. And if you're being bogged down in the details of the stage direction, it will be hard to keep up or to, to maintain the energy of the spot. So I try and keep lines of dialogue down to two or like one or two sentences. Um, before moving on to stage direction and for stage direction, I tend to try and keep it down to two or three lines max and less is definitely more here. Again, you want it to flow. You want to like paint this picture. You almost, you almost want to perform it to your CDs, like try and get them excited about the script. And if you're get it, like if there's too much talking in one block or there's too much stage direction in a block, it can really take the energy out of that spot. And even if the characters don't have anything to do, like even if they're having, even if this, this person has a lot to say, I try and sneak little lines of stage direction in there just to try and break it up, even if they're not doing anything. Um, so like, here's an example from a Fisher Price script that I wrote where it's um, Denzel. Yes, it was written for Denzel Washington. Steps back. He looks at his friends fondly. And then we have this line of dialogue, which very easily these two lines of dialogue could be together. And Denzel says, you all have taught me how to work together and how to connect through RFID technology, but I must go now. And here you very easily could put this last line up there, but I felt personally that I wanted to give us a pause. And so I said, we feel Denzel's dramatic sincerity. And then Denzel continues, it's time for a change because I have a poopy. And I, and that line, we feel Denzel's dramatic sincerity. You don't need it there, but I put it there because I felt like I wanted to, like I wanted to create a certain pace. I wanted to create a dramatic pause um, for the CDs I was presenting it to. And that line, we feel Denzel's dramatic sincerity is actually what I consider a cheat. It's something that I kind of learned to do with time. It's, it's a little tricky where I think a lot of times with stage direction, especially as creative writers, I spent a lot of time trying to paint a picture or like create a feeling in my CDs or, or in my partners or in my scripts in general. And eventually what I realized is like, that takes a lot of words to try and paint a picture or try and create a feeling. I should just tell people exactly how they should be feeling um, instead of trying to like create something. And so this is what I consider a cheat. We feel Denzel's dramatic sincerity you're basically telling your audience exactly what they're supposed to be feeling instead in so in like so few words instead of trying to paint a picture and you'll figure out with your director and on set how to create that dramatic sincerity at this point you can just tell your audience what they're supposed to be feeling and it's a good way it's like a little trick of like keeping your stage direction short is like it's the most delicious food you can imagine or we all want to be at that place right now instead of trying to describe these things, you can just tell people exactly how they should be feeling about them. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's a delicate balance. It's a delicate dance between stage direction and dialogue, um, especially if you're trying to create some kind of like momentum or energy in your spot. And the, the easiest answer, if, it, if your spot has a flow to it, is to read it out loud to yourself. And if you get bored or you get lost, then you probably need to go back and reformat your script and make it clearer or faster. And a lot of times I'll, I'll write a script and I'll ask myself, how can I make this more interesting? 
Sometimes there's not a way, but sometimes there are where I'll look at a script and I'll say, what if I changed the location? What if they're not in their living room? What if they're on a train? What if they're not in an office building? What if they are, I don't know, in a rocket ship? Does that change the spot at all? Does it make it more interesting? If I just change locations, um, does that make my spot more interesting or more funny? And also change the activities that that the people in this in the spot are doing. See if that makes it more interesting, or see if that affects the spot at all. Again, like if you're chasing somebody on the top of a train, some comedy things might pop up that you wouldn't get if you put your characters in an office building in a boardroom. Just see if there's ways of like, oh, if I just change who these people are, their professions, does that add a level of interest to this spot? Um, if I just change the location, will that make the spot more interesting than it is? Than it is. And here's like two examples that I've used before in spots. One of them was like I had to kind of give a fairly straight line of dialogue for this particular product. And I came with this, this spot where it was like, well, what if they were swimming? Like this spot, like these, this, this person has to say these words. What if I had them swimming and we could only hear their words when they pop up above the water and then they pop back down underwater and you can't hear their words. So they're up and down and up and down. And we're only getting little snippets of what this person is saying. Is that funny? I'll try it out. And so I wrote up a spot where it was like somebody kind of like doing the butterfly and talking and it turned out. I thought it was kind of funny. And um, volcanologists, like what if these aren't just regular people? What if they were volcanologists and they were standing in lava and they were wearing those dumb tin, tin suits and they were slowly sinking into the lava and they, and that kind of creates like a timer. Like they have to get their words out before they're completely engulfed in this lava. Does that make it funny? Um, just see if there's ways of like changing your spots a little bit to add a little bit of interest to them. So um, Andy, that, yeah, those last two pages are kind of go along with the theme of, uh, taking it to the edge of madness, although you just said it as making it more interesting. But I think I always want to push all work as far as it could possibly go. In fact, I want to push it beyond as far as it can go and then pull it back a little bit. But mm -hmm. can you think of any other ways? So what I basically like one way that you clearly do that is you say, what if I change the location and what if I change the people? Are there any other ways, like when you're trying to make a piece of creative more interesting or crazy or which is all, it's all about making it more interesting, but are there other ways besides the changing the location and the, the people, what the people do or what they're doing? Yeah. Well, like, I, I mean, one that comes right to the top the top of my mind is we already kind of talked about it, but see if you can put it to music. Music is always a little, I mean, not always is oftentimes more interesting than people just talking. So is it funnier as a song? Is it better as a song than as people just talking? Um, that's the first one that I could think of. I think also um, just making it more, like just more of whatever it is. Like, yeah. If the and, joke and, is, vi if the joke is, uh, comedic violence, what happens if you make it four times more comedic violence in the spot? You know, yeah. uh, what happens? Then? Yeah. And I think, that, and I, and I think that's a good point. I think that there's a lot of time, I spent, again, like I think that you get more leeway in TV ads than you do in a lot of other forms of media. S so I think like we've seen a lot of things in our heads that's like, oh, like this level of like comedic violence, if we're sticking with that same kind of device, I've, I've seen it go up to this level and like the, the comedy shows, the dark comedy shows that I've seen. I think like it's worth trying to push it further. And especially really like I think if there's like an overarching like um, theme to, to how, me writing a script, it's it's just a script. Like you can really write down whatever you want. Let somebody else tell you that's too far. Let somebody else tell you that's too much. And, and then you can kind of pull back from there. And so, yeah, I think it like there's, 
if you've reached a, if, if like the idea is like comedic violence, um, see how far you want to push it. Don't worry about what other people do or what other people, what you, other things that you've seen, like how far can I push this? When does it keep being funny and when does it stop being funny? And it's a very personal thing. And yeah. some people will tell you to rein it in. Some people will say that's not far enough and then you can keep going. But the, these initial scripts before you present them to the CDs, it really should be very personal, all about you and like the things that you want to make. Don't yeah, worry and, about and what other people do. Like we've said, the uh, a lot of people watching this are creative directors, but a lot of people, a mm-hmm. lot of uh, um, them are still creatives. I mean, we're all creatives, but they are not yet creative directors. And I think when you're not a creative director yet, it's the only time in your career where you don't have to be the responsible one. You don't have to, to worry about whether something goes too far. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Just yeah. in fact, worry about making sure that you do push it far enough. And that's the job. There's a whole bunch of other people whose their whole job is to make sure that this thing doesn't go too far. So let them do that job. That's not your job. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So push it to the limit. Take it to the limit. Um, be, uh, I don't think I've, I've shared this slide yet. Be a, be a hard audience. As you're writing your script, be conscious of how you're feeling. Always kind of like look back at what you're doing or be like conscious of what you're writing down. If you're getting bored writing your script, it's probably not a great script and that might be the concept is wrong and you need and scrap it. Or it might just be, I need to kind of rethink the script and make it more interesting because if you're feeling bored writing it, pretty sure people are going to feel bored listening to it. And if you feel like your spot hits a lull, like if you're right, if even if you have a great, a great concept and you're writing the script and you kind of hit a spot where you're like, I don't really know where to go from here or like this part kind of feels dead to me, chances are the person that you're presenting this to will feel that same lull or will feel that same kind of like dip in energy at that same spot. And it's, this is where I think a lot of, I think a lot of times for me, my ideas or the jokes that I come up with or like the the scripts that I have only last about 15 seconds in my head. Like I've only like worked that much out. And then I hit this spot where I'm like, Oh, what do I do next? Or this is starting to feel predictable. And at this point I either, I do, I do one of three things. I either break my spot or I come up with another joke or I scrap the script. Like if I don't feel like there's a way of, of saving it or moving on, I scrap it. But breaking the spot again, I don't know if this is like, industry terminology. It's something that I say when it comes to my scripts. Um, Breaking the spot is simply put, it's like if you're making a change mid script that either adds a new twist or subverts expectations, basically you're just trying to get new interest in this, in this script that you have Um, ways of doing this is like, just see if there's a formula at, is my spot hitting a lull because my formula is becoming predictable? And if it is, then maybe I need to change the formula or I need to subvert expectations within that formula. Um, Has my joke run its course? Like again, like most jokes can't last for 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Um, Is it time for me to add a new element to the spot to, to, to keep interest? Um, And Again, like this idea of breaking your spot, it sometimes it's dramatic. And I have two spots here. They're both very formulaic and they both have breaks in them. And and this one in particular is very, is very drastic. Um, And this is a spot that I did for Old Spice a few years ago. Old? Spice. Old. Spice. Old. Spice? Old? Spice! Spice! Today. Tomorrow. Forever. Spice. 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 Old? Endless Ambassador. We make sense. 
for men. So yeah, that spot again, like very formulaic, like kind of a game of Marco Polo um, back and forth. And then at the end, like obviously that formula is very established. It's pretty dried out and dead by the end of it. So you break it and you have these characters talk over each other. Again, one of the things from the bank. I love the idea of people talking over each other in a, in an ad. And then this one, sometimes the breaks are subtle. And this spot in particular that we did for Galax, for Samsung Galaxy was a montage spot that had a very strict formula to it of people asking why their phone couldn't do certain things. And there's actually some very subtle breaks in here to kind of keep it interesting. There's at least five of them. So if you want to try and pick out what they are, um, go ahead. Why can't I buy this weird shaved meat sandwich with my phone? Why can't my phone have a big screen but be small enough to fit in these fashionably tight pants? Why can't my battery last long enough to navigate me through these scary woods? Ugh, eh, probably find them. Why can't my phone have enough memory to hold all 145 of my movies, like that one with the action in the martial arts? You seen that one? Why can't my phone take high quality, low light photos instead of this big, expensive camera? Why don't you come down from there, sir? You got it. Why doesn't my phone work after I pour this expensive champagne all over it? How am I supposed to show people how rich and carefree I am? Why can't my phone turn into a VR machine so somebody, you know, hypothetically could escape from their reality? Why is everyone talking about phones instead of more important things like pick and roll defense? Now the three fundamentals of pick Why can't I make a call from my phone? What? Why can't I make a call on my watch when I no longer have a phone? Why did I have to wait so long in this commercial to do a celebrity sports person cameo? Why can I not play Elven Warriors of the Seventh Gap Parade in the show? Why don't I ever get asked to be the spokesperson in a commercial? <laughs> Good question. Introducing the only water-resistant, fast, wireless charging, best camera having, memory expandable, pay almost anywhere, Samsung Galaxy S7 Edge. VR experience ended. Man, I would have made a great spokesperson. The new Do Everything Galaxy S7 Edge. Yeah. And, and in this case, like a lot of those breaks were just people not either not talking about the phone, talking about something completely different or having like side characters comment on what people were doing. So it wasn't just always one person talking to camera about the phone. Is there ways to kind of add texture to that to kind of like make these vignettes a little bit more rich? When you say break, do you basically just mean like, as soon as something becomes predictable, as you think the audience is going to expect, if the audience expects A to happen, then that's when you have to break it and make B happen or C or Z or whatever. Just like something unexpected happens. Is that what you mean by a break? Yeah, I think that's like, a pr like, I think that's what I would, how I would define the, the, breaking within the old spice spot where they're saying old and spice to each other for the Y spot, the Samsung spot to me, breaking that spot is you have this very established formula. Is there any way I can add a little bit of texture to it? So it's not just people looking at camera telling me about the phone. So having like doc rivers talk about pick and roll defense or having James Harden talk about like, why did it take this long for me to become a, to do a celebrity sports cameo? Like just having them not talk about the phone is to me a break um, because it just adds a little bit of texture to what people are saying and what you're hearing about, especially in that spot. That spot's like two minutes long. Like you don't want to just listen to people talk about their phone for two minutes. Like, is there some way I can inject something else in there and it and sometimes it's unpredictable um or like surprising and sometimes it's just trying to add a little bit of variance in what people are saying and in that spot it wasn't just cutting to people who don't talk about the phone it was also it there was that then there was people who do talk about the phone they do ask a question that's about the phone but then someone else in the scene appears and does some, you know, the guy with the camera, the, then the police are there and the police say something. Yeah, that's probably, 
that's probably the clearest example of that where the, the guy with the camera or with the giant camera says his line and then the police tell him like, why don't you come down from there? And he's like, okay, like that little exchange is enough of like a departure from the formula to, to, for me, I feel like it breathes new life into it and lets you kind of get back to the formula and started anew, I guess, because you've kind of given people something else to watch and, and something a little different. Yeah. It's um, basically the nature of a misdirect of a comedic misdirect is you first have to create something predictable. You can't just yeah. make a you can't just make a film that's just pure randomness. Nothing's ever predictable and therefore you can't really do a misdirect because you have to get people's mind going in one direction where they think they know what's going to happen next in order to create a misdirect. So there's a there's a yeah. role for a formula formulas aren't all bad you just have to create those breaks and misdirections yeah and those those spots are very like there's very clear formulas to those and so the the clearer the formula maybe the easier it is to break but sometimes your spot isn't like a list of predictable moments it's maybe just more of like a narrative spot you can still work in breaks that way too, where you can kind of build up to what people might be expecting and then take a left turn instead of a right turn, which is not quite as like easily recognized as in these two spots because they do have very structured formulas. But I, whenever I write a spot that even has like a, a very clear narrative, if I feel like the ending is coming up and it's pretty predictable, is there a way I can take a, a left turn, try and get away from that ending that I feel is coming and see if there's a different way of ending it. And that kind of leads into this. Sorry for cutting Andy off there. If you want to listen to his answer and the remainder of this podcast, there's still a great hour left to check out school of astonishing pursuits.com and apply for creative mega machine. If you get in, Jason Bagley himself will teach you the secrets and techniques to doing the best work of your life. We hope you enjoy the first part of the episode, and we hope to see you in the second. And take a minute to like and subscribe and click the little alert bell to be the first to know when the next episode drops.